The material that you're about to listen to and engage with came from our 2017 Missiology Lectures when myself, along with my colleague Johnny Ramirez Johnson, said we need to do this next 2017 Missiology Lectures on this topic of race theology and mission. And we invited Dr. Love Seacrest to engage with us in that process. We wanted to explore the challenging questions regarding racism and ethnocentrism and xenophobia and all of those issues from the perspective of world Christianity with regard to how these realities have existed in many parts of the world and also as part of the colonial mission endeavors. It is fascinating to think that the realities we were talking about are not the experiences of one individual or even one society. We're talking about whiteness as a way of defining the world. And the conference and the conference presenters address time and again this epistemology, this way of making meaning. It has also been described as colonization and post-colonization. The question is not, it's not about guilt, it's about engagement. It's about what are we going to do with what we have inherited. Uh, so the fact that we're having the conversation should not point a finger at you as a listener or viewer. But these are hard conversations. Um, the conversation about race is one that has been deferred for so long and so often, over and over again, as soon as we get close to having a meaningful conversation about race, um, we recoil from the pain of it. And so in our lectures, there are you'll see some of that pain emerge. You'll see some people who have long experienced racism uh, express and, de and declare and name experiences that they um, have had that have been deeply formative, deformative even. So this conversation is not a pretty one, but we're having it. As observers, as uh, listeners, you will be engaging, and we invite you to invite the Holy Spirit. The three of us pray a lot about this series. Mm -hmm. We humbly submitted to God and pleaded for God's mercy to lead us. We are feeble and combined. We are imperfect, and we have prayed that the Lord will fill the gaps and the conversation is only a starter. It is in your hands. It is in your community. It is in your family. And most importantly, it is on your knees. Mm. You know, I have to have my notes because Bill, my husband, says that, you know, when I tell a story, I like to give every single detail. And he says, no, it doesn't have to be that long. So I've learned I better just write it down because otherwise I'll just go on. And I know that Amos doesn't want me, me to go beyond my time limit. So uh, the good news is that I'm first and nobody can steal my thunder. <laughs> Uh, the bad news is I'm first, and I can't lead off of what anybody else says. But here we go. And I feel like, really, I'm here to learn from the incredible speakers that are here for this next two or three days. And, uh, you know, I feel that inadequate, actually, to take the lead on this important subject matter. So I can't speak from that expertise, but I can speak from a little bit of knowledge and a vast global experience and try to get some of our thinking juices flowing. Race, class, ethnicity, gender, religion are all categories that we humans have invented as a way to separate, to divide, to exert power, or as some say, to just organize. Our stereotypes and biases might be different from country to country, but ultimately they all serve the same purpose categorize and form an other over whom I am superior and over whom I can exert power. 
Growing up in Latin America, for example, we innocently called Asians, all Asians, Chinos, Chinese. Whether you were born in Latin America and your parents and grandparents had lived there long before, you still were Chinos. You know, in, in a class at Fuller with Oscar Garcia Johnson in Spanish, the students were talking about, a lot of Central Americans were in the class and they were talking about how everybody refers to us as Mexicans. And, you know, why can't the distinctions and the distinctiveness of who we are individually as groups of people not be melded together under this category, Mexican. And this one student who was in the class, he let, raised his hand and he said, wait a minute, you know, think about what you just said from Latin America, because I am peruano, I'm from Peru, but I have a Korean descent. And yet everybody there in Latin America, including some of you in this room, call me Chino, Chinese. So, you know, these are the issues that we face. In Spain, my daughter and her family were living about three years ago, and our preschooler granddaughter came home learning a song about the Chino Cappuccino, the Capuchin Chinese man. Her class would be performing the song at the end of year festival, and along with the words came instructions for painting slanted eyes and dressing in a black trash bag as a monk's garb. My daughter and son-in-law were horrified and went to talk to the teacher. To their surprise, she said, this is a tradition. We have nothing against Asian people. It's just a cultural song. We do it every year. Never mind that there were a couple of Chinese kids in the class and no concern was taken to ask them or their parents. And when other parents were asked about it, they too said there was, this was not evidence of racism. It was just a nice cultural song. And we all can recall similar incidents, I'm sure. Geography or place you live also is sometimes the factor that creates the other, as in the Philippines where the lowlanders look down on the highlanders. Or religion, like right now in Myanmar, when the other are the Rohingya people, completely expendable and need to stay over there. And I can go on. The point is that the U.S. does not have a corner on race, ethnicity, etc., as points of separation. But because it is such a powerful country, it has exported division through imperialistic and religious means. This country has continuously seen the other as people to be separated out, either by deportation, incarceration, or by public and economic policies of exclusion. Native Americans were banned to reservations. During the Great Depression, the U.S. stepped up enforcement of immigration laws and expelled more than 350,000 Mexicans, including their U.S.-born children. In the 1940s, at least 120,000 U.S. citizens of Japanese descent were expulsed to, uh, expelled to concentration camps. The current administration is really planning on dividing by building a wall and deporting 11 million people, purify our race. And to keep the theme going on, incarcerate all those who should be slaves, take away their freedom, make them work for nothing so that others can get rich. The US locks up more people per capita than any other nation some 2.3 million people. And about 60% of those locked up are Black, Latino, or Native Americans. So we ask, where's Christianity in this picture? How has our theology impacted race and mission? The unequal outcomes we see today are very much due to systems that have been set up a long time ago. Rebecca Ann Gertz, in her book on the baptism of early Virginia says that the link between Christianity and race has ebbed and flowed. Christianity has been deployed to both make and unmake race. Christianity has been used to define whiteness and blackness, 
and it has been used to attempt to make those categories meaningless. Religious and racial categories continue to matter today, though they are no longer rendered in their 17th century form. Yet Christianity is still used and abused to create race and difference in ways that should profoundly disturb the modern world. What I found interesting and telling in her books, among many things, is the seeming shallowness of Christianity in early America. Rebecca Getz Gertz tells the story of Reverend Morgan Goodwin, who came from England from a world that emphasized the universality of Christianity. He believed, along with most Englishmen who had been born in England and lived out their lives there, that any person could convert to Christianity, regardless of their origin. The colonial experience had corrupted that understanding of Christianity. In the New World, Godwin found planters believed in slave blacks were inherently incapable of becoming Christian. This notion apparently extended to native people as well. This new belief was really convenient for the settlers. Dehumanizing Indians and enslaving Africans helped settlers to marginalize and control them. That idea was anathema to Godwin, who found that these planters abroad held beliefs that were actually quite heathen. After accusing English people of heathen behavior, Godwin found himself unwelcome in the colonies. Even allowing for Godwin to exaggerate the situation in Virginia, Gert says he was reacting against a trend he observed in the colony, one that separated people on the basis of their Christianity and associated Christianity with English descent and heathenism with Indian or African descent. By describing the corrupt custom that rendered enslaved people unable to be Christian, Godwin exposed a feature of colonial life, the conflation of religious and racial categories. I think we exported that same attitude, perhaps not explicitly, but definitely implicitly in much of our mission work. In the colonial period, mission, missionaries traveled along with the colonizers as a convenience and as a strategy. According to Eddie Arthur in his article on the future of mission agencies, from the point of view of those receiving the missionaries, it could be very difficult to separate out the religious agenda on the mission, of the missionaries from the political and commercial agenda of their colonial overseers. There was also an inevitable power gap the missionaries being seen to be backed by vast wealth and military power of the empire. And in very subtle ways, modern day missionaries can also be conveyors of the power differential. I remember when we arrived in the Philippines as a young family, we were met by white missionaries, taken to the mission compound where we stayed for six weeks until we found a house to live in, and the only Filipinos we met were either household servants, gardeners, taxi drivers, market vendors, etc. What kind of statement is being passed to this newly arrived young couple? Filipinos are not the same as us. We stay in our enclave, socialize, we see, see, see things through the lens of other missionaries. In other words, it is we and it is them. After about three weeks, we finally met some Filipinos who would become our colleagues and friends. Thank God he intervened. Is it any wonder that missionaries are perceived as white, powerful people? This brings me to my concluding questions. How deep is our Christianity? If we continue to carry this image forward in our, in our, in our encounters with people, whether here in the US or abroad, how do we embody the biblical concept of power, the type of power Jesus had, thinking of others greater than ourselves, being the servant, not the served? Jesus did all kinds of things that broke through the norms of class, race, gender, and religion, hanging out with those who were marginalized, engaging a woman to be his evangelist in Samaria, coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, a true sign that he was not about imperial power. I am hoping that this concept 
of the Jesus of power, or not power, will be addressed at this conference in a way that we can see a path forward. Thank you.